Hello everyone and welcome to the penultimate session on the Smart Stage Day 2 at Event Tech Live US and Canada. I am joined by Jeff, the Chief Technology Officer and President at SoftGen, as well as Lubomir, Head of the Solution um, Department, also from SoftGen. Jeff, Lubomir, welcome to today's session. Hello. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks. So the session, checkerboard seating, a new reality when venues open, something I'm sure is at the top of everybody's priority list, figuring out how to seat people. I know you guys got a lot of details about how you might go about that and how you can overcome those challenges. So I'll give you the floor over to you. Look forward to hearing from you during this presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Jeff Kreiser. I'm president and uh, CTO at Softurn. Uh, Softurn is an engineering services company, uh, and we work with uh, ticketing providers all over the world, uh, providing engineering services and solutions. Uh, with me is, I'll let him introduce himself. Hello. Yeah, my name is Lubomir, and I'm a solution architect at Softurn. Yeah. Working with okay. ticketing projects for a long time. All right, thank you, Lubomir. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, uh, social distancing and and different ways that um, ticketing uh, providers go about um, doing uh, social distancing. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how some data can be used to to do that. Um, some uh, of the social distancing is done uh, manually. Uh, putting two groups of twos, threes, fours, whatever uh, together. Uh, some of the capacity is defined by local regulations. And so that can vary widely as to how many people you're actually allowed to have at an event. You know, 20%, 25% seems to kind of be the um, average, um, at least from what I've seen. And, and then we're also going to talk about um, some other ways that um, social distance seating can be done, and that's more dynamically. So, and and part of the reason for that is to try to maximize capacity. So, if um, for instance, if you do it manually, you can only do so many seats. But if you actually do it dynamically, um, you can uh, fit more people in there. And and some of the pros and cons to doing both methods, as well as some of the advantages and disadvantages for clients. So. Um, so, and one of the thing is that, um, you know, usually there's a, a predefined way. So obviously someone goes to buy a ticket and what you see is that, um, you go to pick your seats and they're, they're already pre-selected. All the seats that are, are required to do proper social distancing are, are blocked off and you're forced to do, you know, pick accordingly. Um, and then uh, dynamic seat allocation, which I, I, I just touched upon before. There's kind of two ways of doing it. One is um, delayed. So just before the event, you go and do uh, a best fit algorithm to allocate all those seats according to who has bought tickets. And uh, But then there's another way of doing that at time of purchase. Okay. So get my clicker back. So um, once again, predefined uh, venue seating chart. So, you know, some of the inputs in order to do this. So here we have an example, um, just a, a very simple uh, um, group of seats. Um, it has a capacity of, in this case, just 488. Um, it shows a 23% utilization. And here we have groups of, you know, we, we just did this um, you know, we have groups of one, two, threes, uh, up to sixes. So inputs to this would be um, obviously capacity. How many, how many, what's, what, how many, um, what's the percentage that you're allowed to have? Um, historical data. Um, that's used to uh, define probably, you know, groupings, right? So um, maybe different events, different shows, different sporting events have different common uh, numbers of tickets that are sold, whether it's twos, fours, whatever kind of thing. And so you can use that too to help determine how many of uh, different size groups you want, right? And uh, and then of course, um, 
how what the capacity is, how many seats you have also comes into how far apart you have to be. And once again, that comes down to some local items and um, you know what those regulations are. So um, what are some of the pros and cons of doing predefined venue seating? Obviously a pro is that it's uh, easy to implement. Um, you know, you don't re really require any software changes in the uh, ticketing system. Um, you can do this all manually and uh, and and set that up and and duplicate it from event to event quite quite simply. Um, you know, so cons. Uh, usually, you wind up with a, a lower capacity. Um, you know, the utilization is going to be less than if you can do something dynamically. Uh, you know. And and sometimes that happens with um, not only the fact that uh, you're you're making a best guess at at the groupings and how that works, but you can also run into problems where um, available seating becomes underutilized. So uh, you sell out all your groupings of two, but now you have people coming who want only two seats. So you know what do you do? Do you you sell only those two seats? Do you um, some places you know? make you buy all four seats for only two um, or you don't go, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and of course that leads to some reduced patron satisfaction because you know a group may need to split up or sit in locations that uh, they would not find as desirable as if this was done dynamically or they could uh, pick their seats at uh, purchase time. So, um, you know, Dynamic seat allocation is 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 something is something different, right? So it's it's in in this case we're talking about you delay it to as close as possible to the event start date. So what mm -hmm. you're doing is you're taking all those different sales and you're grouping them together, and and so when you're doing that, you're uh, better doing some better utilization so there's the possibility you could actually have some more seats available um, you're putting the groups together you're maximizing uh, that capacity uh, obviously the cons here is that it requires uh, changes to how you um, you do your ticket sales uh, patrons may not um, know exactly where they're going to be uh, sitting they might be given a general area but that doesn't mean that they they uh, know exactly where they might have to, you know, want to sit or where they might be sitting. Um, you know, it requires some some tools and some uh, data, once again, to be built into the ticketing system in order to kind of do this algorithm and, and do the seating. Um, you know, you can do it manually, uh, but it, it definitely is not an easy uh, task to accomplish. Uh, and then the other thing here is that you actually might sell some seat, more seats than you can actually accommodate. Um, and that's happened before too. So, okay. Lubomir. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, Jeff mentioned about one option for dynamic uh, seats. I can elaborate on the second option. So let me go to the next slide. So, uh, Oh, it's too too far away. Okay, here it is. So the time of purchase. Uh, so with uh, this option, uh, the venue seating chart will be presented to the patron with all available seats and without social distance. But once a patron has chosen their seat, all the surrounding seats are blocked to create a social distance, like we see in the animation. This can be achieved via changes in the best available algorithm or in the pick your own seats tool. There can be, you know, different options uh, defined to create a safe zone. So the most common are number of rows in front or behind the selected seats and number of seats on the left and on the right. Those seats become unavailable for the next patrons buying tickets. As a result, we have a better capacity utilization as seats are booked by patrons request. Good user experience as patrons know where they will see and there is no need for event organizers staff to be involved in seating arrangement. 
At the same time, to achieve this, a ticketing system must adopt the technology change in the pick your own seats or best available algorithm functions. Okay, so um, uh, now uh, let, let's look at the side by side comparison of the static versus dynamic methods. As we can see, with an equal number of seats on each side, we have more inventory left on the right due to more efficient capacity utilization. And this is for the case that all seats defined on the left will be sold. You know, chances are that some seats will not be purchased or purchased partially if ticketing system allows that. So the real difference may be even bigger. As you can see now, uh, on the left there are some seats in green that may not be purchased or will, um, and will cause an additional revenue loss to for event organizer. Okay, well, now I will pass you over again to Jeff to discuss uh, the additional aspects of the event planning with um, social distance. Yeah, um, one of the things too is that, uh, uh, Lumina, did you have anything to add on the dynamic seat, um, the delayed allocation? Um, you know, I had talked about oh. that a little bit. Um, did you have anything to add on on, on that area? Well, yeah, basically we covered it, uh, how this works. I can just say that, you know, uh, the, the overall idea is just to delay the allocation process as close to the e event start date. So that event organizer knows more about who is coming to the event. So um, they can, you know, uh, try to, like we have talked in, for the static allocation, right? They try to guess that uh, based on some historical data and, you know, some forecasting, right? Uh, with the delay, they kind of know already who has, you know, purchased uh, the um, tickets, what group size, uh, you know, is, and, you know, they know how many twos uh, and how many, you know, threes and then fours and so on will be coming to the event. So uh, this is more like, uh, real data that they can play with, they can uh, arrange it uh, on uh, on the map. But you know, as Jeff mentioned, that requires some efforts, obviously. So uh, you need really to then uh, have this list of uh, orders and kind of try to put them on the map and uh, see where you know you can feed them, take into account all the social distance rules, all the you know. Um, uh, other factors, so maybe you would like to um, to kind of check, okay, here are my donors or VAP members and I will put them more, you know, to the, give them a little bit better seats or maybe I will rearrange based on the group size or other factors. So uh, that is, you know, a little bit, you know, time consuming uh, task and, um, um, you know, it's not ideal obviously because you can plan the seating allocation, um, but then the customers may not like it, or you can end up, um, as we also mentioned that, you know, due to social regulations, you may not fit all the ticket buyers that were, you know, interested in going to this event. So, yeah, and, and this option, like uh, I just talked about the um, time of purchase allocation, Kind of handles all of that because you know this is more like dynamic way right you select your seed you 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 see the safe zone created automatically and uh, that is more efficient from one point and uh, less frustrating for the customers on the other side so yeah just just to add mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you lumer yeah so so here at software and as a, as a technology uh engineering provider, we uh, have our own reserve seating uh, tool that we license. And one of the things we did earlier on when it was recognized that uh, this was going to need to happen is that we took uh, the best seat algorithm that the tool used and modified that, adding some parameters to allow for um, taking out of, of uh, inventory. So when you said, okay, give me, show me the two best seats that I can purchase in this um, section and, and this price range, it would go in there, it would look at um, 
can I can I allow aisle seats or do I have to leave aisle seats open in order to create that distance for people going up and down the aisle? How many can uh, one row, two rows? How many rows do I have to skip in order to create that distance, as well as the number of seats in between? And so that that tool was modified so that it could be configurable to 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 allow you know um, that. Um, distancing uh, and modify that as needed and then um, you know automatically uh, block those seats out as the algorithm went and and pick seats uh, and and that way it it um, made it uh, much more friendly for um, users to obviously be able to uh, decide kind of where they wanted to sit much easier and um, you know instead of you know being forced into different groups or whatever or into different seating areas because oh okay you can't do two seats here or one seat there um it also uh, helped with that uh configuration so and as we've shown here um it also does help maximize because you know it optimizes as you sell so that's the other thing that's a big advantage uh to doing it dynamically so uh so one uh one of the other things we we just kind of like to uh, just touch base on is that obviously uh, you know social distancing is not the only thing that's um, you know come up here. There are many other things that um, have to be looked at um, in uh, you know holding live events uh, more and more. And and I'm sure most of us have all heard about these things or 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 um, discuss them in many different ways. So, um, but I just kind of like to, as a, as a wrap up here, touch on a couple of these things. So uh, some of them is uh, obviously access control. Um, and, and a lot of these things come out of um, things that we've been talking with or, um, you know, clients of ours or other conversations or what we had with, um, you know, uh, people in, in the ticketing industry. So access control. So um, a lot of that was, um, you know, how do you do that without, you know, you, it used to be, um, you know, you have a, you have a device and I'm going to stand next in, in the doorway and everybody's going to come through and I'm going to scan you. Well, now you don't want to be that close. You still want to keep that social distance. So a lot of interest was put into uh, pedestals where one person can stand back, watch it. It's very obvious if uh, they're um, allowed to enter or exit. And, um, you know, and not only that, but one person can watch multiple uh, pedestals. So we've done um, uh, quite a bit of work with uh, companies who've taken um, and invested in in more of the uh, pedestals for use in access control. Um, timed entry and exit, that's something that's been discussed uh, in, order, in order to keep crew, groups down and queues down, um, you know, making sure that people are coming in at the right time and, and leaving. So, um, you know, obviously the uh, use of virtual or hybrid events. So that's also, you, not only are you going to sell live tickets, but you're probably still going to want to try to do some kind of online or virtual um, service too, or some kind of, of capability there just for the fact that um, if you're limited in capacity, you, you know, many times it's still going to, uh, you know, be advantageous to offer a, a virtual view of that in order to uh, uh, increase revenues. Uh, health screening, uh, obviously that's important and that's going to vary widely um, on what part of the world you're in and what's allowed uh, by local law or local regulations. So uh, some of that might be, you know, checking and requiring tests before the event, uh, coming into the event, um, you know, providing some kind of uh, vaccination document, you know, in order to, uh, you know, be allowed. So, I mean, some places are going vaccination only and that kind of thing. Uh, contact tracing, obviously still very important, even, even as, you know, the rates of vaccination go up and things are opening more because if there is some kind of, uh, you know, number of people that have an outbreak, you're gonna definitely wanna let people know. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I think I think uh, COVID-19 has um, made m more obvious is the need to uh, communicate with uh, patrons and fans uh, more and more and, and keep that up. And I think that's going to continue going forward. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, in-seat contactless food ordering and delivery. I think that's here to stay uh, and is only going to uh, grow. 
um, you know, of a vaccine registry check. So what is that going to involve? And, uh, you know, um, we're talking about passports, uh, app tracking, um, all that. And then once again, uh, you know, security, uh, you know, obviously how do you handle um, people that um, don't want to or, you know, abide by the rules. And unfortunately that's uh, definitely a given and so that's still going to be important moving forward. So anyway, I'd like to uh, thank you. And uh, once again, I'm Jeff Kreiser. And uh, with me today was Luba Beer. And uh, we'd certainly like to hear any questions or have any discussion with anybody. If there is uh, questions, please let us know. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, right. The first question that we have here is around historical data. You mentioned that to make this work or part of the input that was needed uh, or would be beneficial was the historical data. Just how much historical data is needed in context? Is it just one previous year? Does it work on previous months? How, how does that element of, the, um, of it work? It's... Well, you know, using data. So, um, as as I'd mentioned, if I mean, you can see patterns in different shows as to what are the groupings that uh, people are buying, right? So, um, mm -hmm. matinees might have a different uh, purchase pattern than a evening show or a Friday night show. You know, a Sunday afternoon show obviously is going to be different. And so, what you want to do is when you're planning, if you're going to pre-plan your seats, you're going to want to use that data, and you can just use previous year data. You you can, uh, you know, it, it depends on how easy it is to get that data and how easy it is to uh, group that data into into the information you need. But even even just having a handful of shows where you can at least have an idea of of what size groupings you should do is better than just randomly going and saying, okay, I'm going to do 10 twos and 10 fours and, and you know, how many sixes kind of thing, because you're just going to limit yourself there. I mean, if, if you can look and say, oh, for this show, we, you know, for matinees, we sell mainly larger family style kind of things where we're doing fours and sixes, but for a Friday night, we're getting the people going, you know, couples going out to dinner or something like that and, and doing that kind of thing. So, I, I think that uh, helps you maximize your your capacity. So, of, yeah. of course, you can, um, you know, in our example of the dynamic, um, we showed you could get more people in. But once again, it depends. Local regulations, you might be limited on percentage. So. Okay. Awesome. Um, I, I, I can just. Kinda... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh. You can. I just want to add that you basically, you know, we, we're talking like about the accuracy of this, right? So uh, the more data we have, then, you know, the better accuracy we can get. Obviously, it's still forecast. It's uh, just trying to analyze what your historical data, you know, uh, are, uh, what you have in your historical records and then trying to forecast it to, to your event. And uh, here... Really, it's more about uh, the amount of data, the structure, how structured they are, what uh, you know, uh, attributes of this data you can capture, like uh, uh, the type of event, uh, the you know, the date, the time, the you know, all the venue, the all, all the different uh, attributes of the event, and then trying to project them to the event you're trying to build the you know optimal seat allocation, right? Okay, awesome. I think that there's uh, that brings us kind of on to the the next question, um, and I must apologise because it's all, it's a very short question. So I'm kind of I'm going to try and yeah. elaborate on it, maybe thinking about where they're going with it. They've asked about dynamic pricing. They've just put dynamic pricing question mark, and I'm, I'm assuming they're asking does does your solution or your the way that your uh, technology works, the way that you've built this, enable them to have some kind of dynamic pricing based on people maybe booking in smaller or larger groupings depending on seating patterns and things like that. I'm, 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 I'm reaching a little bit there, um, uh, but uh, that's kind of maybe where I think that, yeah. that, that question's going. Well, yeah, usually, I mean, usually dynamic pricing comes in on, you know, you're, you're trying to price uh, for demand, right? And mm -hmm. 
And that might be the fact that if you're still going to have to do social distancing, but people are, are say everybody's vaccinated, um, the demand might be there and you may be able to do that. I, I, I personally think, do you, do you necessarily want to do that right now? <laughs> it might not be the, the, you know, the, the best thing to try to go, well, wait a minute. I, I went yesterday and looked for tickets and I saw there were quite a few available. Now I go back today and the price is twice as much or something like that, that, um, you know, I think right now, I think butts and seats might be a, a, a better way to do it than, um, you know, I know, I know the revenue part's important, but um, at least my, you know, kind of from my my view of things, I, I would think that it would might be a, a better idea just to um, do that. But um, just because you have to social distance and you have to limit the seating, there's nothing stopping you from doing any kind of dynamic pricing. Um, you know, our solution um, does not include that. It's it, it, that. I mean, there's there's um, different ways to do it. I mean, I, I know people that do it manually. I know people that, you know, go and get a service that, you know, there's lots of third parties out there that'll help you do it too. I mean, we've worked with some people too in order to implement different algorithms, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I, I, they're two different things. I mean, you can use them in combination, but I, you know, right now I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. if, if I, if I would, if I would look at that myself. <laughs> Yeah, there's some there's some in, there's some interesting pricing strategies going out at the moment. There was a there was an article in the news story this week of a of an event promoter that was doing I think it was like nineteen dollars for vaccinated and nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars for non vaccinated people. Like that was <laughs> like that's either that's a really a, clever that, okay, that, 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 that's interesting uh you know um or, or you could go the yeah you could go the other way uh uh or i'll you know show show up vaccinated and we'll give you something free whatever a reward or something yeah. like that so um well it, I'm, I'm, you know diff different ways to persuade recently. people into it yeah 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 i've seen i've seen certain states in america are kind of putting incentives right for people to get vaccinated so, so maybe that is a strategy from a from an event promoter's yeah. point of view as well yeah well i i mean yeah different places have gone to actually lotteries so every week they've been doing a lottery for vax for if you get vaccinated this week you're automatically entered um i live in california yeah. they've actually set money aside to uh reward people that both get are in the process of getting vaccinated for a lottery and for people that went and did it already so you know the uh, you know, so so far I haven't won anything, but uh, you know, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it's, it's, it, being it to win it is better than nothing, I guess. It's, you know, it's <laughs> right, right. I mean, the, the, yeah, I, yeah. California is going to be unique, and the, they were going to actually include the people that are, had gone and done it already. So, um, but uh, I, think, I think that's I a fair really approach, though, anything. right? I think I think that's a fair approach. Yeah. Um, before uh, we before we wrap up, there's there's one final question that I have here. You mentioned in your presentation delayed allocation, um, and, and you mentioned obviously doing that as close to the event as possible. But the question here is like, how close to the event is that feasibly possible? Is is it like a day? Is it like twenty four hours? Is it is it further out than that? Yeah, for 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 that for the dynamic allocation where you do it just in that bulk, it's not at purchase time, right? You would probably do that at 24 hours ahead of time, so people you know know where they're going to be and where they're going to be sitting, and you know, um, you know, if you've sold out or if you oversold, you're going to have to do a refund because that's a possibility, right? Um, that that could happen yeah. if you leave it to go that long, um, or you can wind up with still some available seats, but. That's not necessarily the worst thing if you can sell them or, or take advantage of it. So, Lubomir, any right. thoughts and on that? Yeah, I just want to add that it may also depend on the size of the venue and uh, the tools right. available. Because yeah. if it's all manual work and you know, uh, and the venue is quite big, you may need more time to to process that uh, information and kind of put everyone uh, on the great spot. But uh, yeah, if, if there are some tools available, maybe you know some some kind of some ways to automate that, then maybe it will be, it will be you know easier process. But you know, you need to evaluate all this. Uh, you know, right. Aspects. Right. And, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good thing to mention. It really depends on what the ticketing system offers too. If they offer some kind of automation for doing that, obviously it's going to be much easier. So, Awesome, guys. Well, Jeff Lubomir, thank you very much for um, uh, presenting this new way of approaching this you know, challenging thing that we now face as an industry. 
Um, for anybody watching now or um, on demand that wants to reach out to, to Jeff and Lubomir, please do reach out to them on the platform or follow up with them after this event. Um, Jeff Lubomir, thanks once again for, for joining me and to the attendees. We'll see you shortly in the last session of the day. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.